Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. I was here, I don't know, maybe like two years ago, maybe. I can't remember how many years. It was on a, I remember it was a Veterans Day Sunday that I was here. Um, so I'm glad to be back with you. Um, and glad to be back with you during this season. I know you're probably getting hit with a lot of uh, Christmas sermons and things like that this time of year. Um, maybe it seems like overkill, but I, I'm just here to say that, you know, the merchants have been all about Christmas since about Labor Day. <laughs> you know? Uh, certainly since Halloween. Anyway, you can't go anywhere without them trying to sell you something that goes with Christmas, but very little of it has anything to do with Jesus, unfortunately. I'm reminded of how back in, uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was, when, uh, when um, the uh, Charlie Brown Christmas uh, was first produced, and how that Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, held out with CBS and said, you want to do this show, you're not going to do it unless we get to tell the true Christmas story. And that's why Linus gets up and recites the story from Luke chapter 2 uh, about the birth of Jesus. And I dare say it's one of the few Christmas movies or television shows that gets put on the air on network or cable television, unless it's an uh, explicitly Christian channel, that really talks about what Christmas is really about, about the Christ in Christmas. You know, we get so bogged down in our Christmas activity that we sometimes forget the nativity. And uh, I don't want that to be the case, so I'm, I'm here to talk about a little bit about Christmas today, and I will next week too, so buckle up and get ready. And I think Brother Ted, who I think maybe did a little bit last week, and I know he's got some more coming up for you with that as well, so just buckle up and get ready. You're going to hear about Christ and Christmas. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dream of sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth, the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And thus begins one of the beloved carols of the Christmas season. It first appeared as a Sunday school hymn for children at the Episcopal Church of the Holy Trinity in Philadelphia shortly before Christmas in 1868. Its tune was composed hastily by the church's uh, choir master, a man named Louis Redner, but its lyrics had been stirring in the heart of its author for three years, for it was on Christmas Eve in 1865 that Phillips Brooks, the rector of the Church of the Holy Trinity, had visited the town of Bethlehem. Now, maybe you've heard of Phillips Brooks and maybe you haven't, but at the time, he was one of the best-known preachers of the 19th century. Uh, he, he was also a very well-known public figure back at a time when, uh, when ministers of large churches in large cities were considered kind of almost like rock stars, when thousands of people would come just to hear them preach on a Sunday. Not only that, uh, he had been a leading voice for the abolition of slavery, and he was actually chosen to deliver a eulogy for Abraham Lincoln when the slain president's uh, funeral train made a stop in Philadelphia on its way from Washington, D.C. to its final place in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and that publication of that speech in newspapers throughout the country really kind of put him on the map as a public figure as well. But the war, the Civil War, and the assassination of the president had sort of taken its toll on Brooks's spirit. He needed some renewal. And so he took a year-long sabbatical to Europe and the Holy Land. And that's how he found himself in the little town of Bethlehem that Christmas Eve in 1865. And the events of that visit then became the basis for that carol that we still sing today, O Little Town of Bethlehem. But Brooks was not the first person to ever wax poetic about that little town of Bethlehem. Somewhere around 2,500 years or so before Brooks produced his text, the Old Testament prophet Micah, who would have been around the same time as Isaiah, Tom, who you mentioned earlier, uh, he had authored these words in the fifth chapter of Micah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Like I say, Micah uttered these words at least 700 years before a host of angels appeared to the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks one night with good news that would cause great joy for all the people. But the Israelites had long interpreted them as prophesying the birthplace of the Messiah. And so it was that when King Herod the Great inquired of the chief priests and teachers of the law concerning where the Messiah would be born, 
They pointed this, these words to him. They, in Matthew chapter 2, they used the exact same words from Micah to tell him where he could find the baby. Why, why King Herod didn't know when everybody else in Israel did is easy to explain. King Herod wasn't even an Israelite. He was, he was a descendant of Esau, not of Jacob, who had been placed in power by the Roman Caesar. So it's not surprising that he was unfamiliar with the prophecies, and he had to ask his advisors when almost everyone in Israel knew that Micah had prophesied the birthplace of the Messiah to be Bethlehem. Um, and so Herod sends the Magi, the wise men, on their way, and they did indeed find the boy Jesus there in Bethlehem. Now, I'm, going to say, I'm not going to say anything much more about the Magi today because I know that Brother Ted plans to preach a sermon to you sometime after Christmas called Wise Men Still Seek Him. So I don't want to steal any of his thunder or step on any of his toes. But I do want to talk about Bethlehem a little bit more today. Um, I want us to consider Bethlehem from the perspective of the events leading up to it. You see, the, the events around the birth of Jesus are really the last time we encounter Bethlehem in the Bible. Uh, there's really, once, once you get past the birth of Jesus, Bethlehem gets no press. It's still there. People still live there and everything like that during New Testament times. But once it's finished its mission, basically, as being the birthplace of Jesus, it kind of fades off into biblical obscurity. But it existed prior to the birth of Jesus. And I want us to talk about that a little bit this morning. You know, the Bible's first mention of Bethlehem is in Genesis 35. It also concerns childbirth because it's the account of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, giving birth to their youngest son, Benjamin, in Bethlehem. Uh, under normal circumstances, that would have been a, an occasion for great joy. Sadly, though, while Benjamin was indeed born a healthy boy, Rachel, as you might know, died during childbirth. And Jacob buried her there in Bethlehem. That was where her tomb is. Uh, this, would be, this wouldn't be the last time that Rachel's name would be connected to sadness in Bethlehem. Because, as you know, the Magi did not return to King Herod, did they? They, went, they were warned by an angel to go away in a different direction, and so they didn't come back to tell King Herod that they'd seen the Messiah and that he was there. And when Herod found out he'd been outwitted by them, what did he do? He had all the baby boys under two years old in Bethlehem killed. Now, Bethlehem was a small town. So it probably wasn't thousands or hundreds, but maybe dozens. But that doesn't lessen the heinousness of what he did. If he'd only killed one child, it would have been enough to mark him out as a, as a hideous you know, uh, person. But Matthew quotes this prophecy when he talks about that, how that Herod had done that. He, he, he quotes this prophecy from Jeremiah 31 when he says this, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The Jews, the Israelites had always interpreted that also as having something to do with Messiah from Jeremiah 31. Well, I don't want to leave us sad about Bethlehem. So our next encounter with Bethlehem is a love story. Uh, but it also begins kind of tragically. So here are these opening words from the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Not the best way to start off a love story, I suppose, with tragedy, right? The good news is, is unlike a lot of stories, the tragedy's right up front, and everything gets happy after that, okay? Um, so I know many of you are probably familiar with the events that happen next. Naomi learns that the famine has ended in Israel, and she decides to return home to Bethlehem. She encourages Orpah and Naomi, her Moabite daughters-in-law, to remain in their homeland where they can get new husbands and start their lives over again. Orpah says, okay, I'll stay. But Ruth refuses, steadfastly refuses to leave her mother-in-law. In fact, her refusal, I think, consists of some of the most beautiful words 
in all of Scripture. Listen to what she said. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Isn't that beautiful? That devotion of Ruth to her mother-in-law to stay with her. Well, not only does Ruth remain with Naomi, she also helps provide for her. How? Well, you know the story probably by gleaning in the fields of one of Naomi's relatives, a man named Boaz. And in an Old Testament version of a Hallmark movie, Ruth winds up marrying Boaz. Uh, and the final scene in the book is of Naomi holding her grandson, Obed, the son of Boaz and Ruth. It's a beautiful scene. The woman who, when she first got home from Moab, said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. I'm a bitter old woman. I lost my husband. I lost my sons. Life is no good for me. Now she's holding a grandson. But the final words of the book of Ruth are a genealogy. And that genealogy ends with this. It says, Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Yeah, that David. Shepherd boy, David. Giant slayer, David. King, David. And this explains then how little Bethlehem becomes known as the town of David. As the, as the uh, angel said to the shepherds, this day in the town of David is a Savior, Christ the Lord. That's how it became known as the town of David. You know, David was a shepherd keeping watch over flocks outside of Bethlehem. It may have been the exact same fields that the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks the night the angels appeared to them that David had kept his father's sheep in as a boy. Certainly must have been close by. It, it, it was there that, you know, David understood. It's not, it's not surprising to me, based on what the Lord says about himself in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and about how he chose a shepherd boy to be the greatest king of Israel, that the revelation of God sending his son into the world would be first announced to shepherds. God has a special place in his heart for shepherds. And that's why he calls even the leaders of his churches in the New Testament as shepherds over the flock of God. It's that imagery that permeates God's people, both in the Old and the New Testaments. God's leaders are shepherds of God's flock. But the first announcement of the Savior's birth came to those shepherds keeping watch over their flock at night. David had tended sheep probably not far from there. It may have been, it may have been in those same fields that David was called in that day when Samuel came to the house of of Jesse to say, I'm looking for the new king. I need to anoint him. And Jesse said, okay, here are my big boys. You know, they're soldiers. They're big strapping fellas and everything. And what did, what did Samuel say? He said, no, 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 and no. Jesse, you got any more boys? You got any more sons? Uh, well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, the little one. He's out in the field with the sheep. Well, you better get him in here. And, of course, David becomes the anointed one, the one who would become the next king of Israel. It was from Bethlehem later that Jesse then sent David to check on his older brothers who were serving in King Saul's army, which led to David courageously confronting and defeating the giant Goliath, one of the most famous stories in all the Old Testament. And it was to Bethlehem that David would return to be refreshed occasionally during that difficult time between his victory over Goliath and his ascension to the throne. It wasn't seamless. It took a while. You know, David had already been anointed by Samuel before he ever fought Goliath. But Saul wasn't ready to give up the throne yet, and David wasn't going to raise a hand against him. He was going to let the Lord deal with Saul. A good lesson for all of us sometimes. Let the Lord take care of things rather than us trying to force his hand or take care of it ourselves. Well, the second verse of a little town of Bethlehem says this, For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all around, or all above, while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together, proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, and peace to men on earth. You know, when Phillips Brooks went to Bethlehem in 1865, he was getting away 
from a country that had been war-torn. You know, the Civil War had only been over for a few months when he departed to go. He had seen it all. He had seen, you know, one of the worst tragedies, in the, perhaps the worst tragedy in the history of our country as, as relative fought against relative and neighbor fought against neighbor. And he got away from it by going to Bethlehem. Well, today, if you were to go to Bethlehem to try to get away from war, the opposite would be happening, wouldn't it? Um, caught up in the current conflict between Israel and Hamas, Bethlehem has become a very dangerous place, uh, especially for Christian families that have lived there for hundreds of years. And Bethlehem had, has had one of the largest Christian communities in the nation of Israel since Israel was established in 1948. You know, the Israelis are not particularly fond of the Christians there because most of them are Arabs. And Hamas cares even less for them because they're Arabs, but they're not Muslims. And so they are in the middle of all this, trying to be peace-loving believers in Jesus with two sides coming at them. Um, many of them have been displaced in recent years and been driven out uh, either by Hamas or by Israeli settlements or both. Uh, wondering, living in refugee camps and things like that, Bethlehem is not the peaceful, sleepy town that it was on the night that Jesus was born, although it probably wasn't all that sleepy because there were so many people there because of the census, you know, or when Phillips Brooks went there. The peace on earth that's promised by the angels about the coming of Jesus has not yet touched Bethlehem in this generation. But that's the truth for a lot of places in this world, isn't it? It's not just Bethlehem that's struggling. You can throw a dart at the world and almost always hit someplace where people are at war, at conflict, whether it's Ukraine, Bethlehem, wherever it is. There are people struggling with peace. And it becomes very depressing sometimes for people to think about the peace that's supposed to come from the Prince of Peace. It doesn't seem to have really permeated our world the way that we would hope that it would. Yet the final two verses of Brooks' Sunday School song still give us hope. He says, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. You know, Brooks reminds us that true peace on earth can only come when the people of earth allow Christ to enter into their meek souls, casting out their sins, inviting him to abide with us as Emmanuel, God with us. You know, many of us have already have or will spend much money on gifts and friends for loved ones this Christmas, and that's all well and good. I hope you enjoy giving gifts to, your, to everyone. But Christmas presents without Christ's presence can never result in the peace that the angels sing about over the little town of Bethlehem all those years ago. Peace, shalom in Hebrew, is something that we all wash, wish for. It means not only absence of conflict with other people, but wholeness before God and others, a way in which you feel like every morning when you get up, you want to face the day because you know the Lord is with you. That's the striving, the kind of peace that only God can bring to our hearts and the kind of peace that we need to share with others during this season, letting them know that they can indeed have peace. Even in a world that's war-torn and full of strife, we can have peace because of Christ. And it's that peace that we need to share with others. What's going to bring solutions to the problems of this world? Only Jesus. Only Jesus can make us into the kind of people that seek peace and love with others. As another song reminds us, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son to that little town of Bethlehem all those years ago. But not only sent him to that little town, but also up that hill of Calvary at the end of those 33 years to provide the sacrifice and the atonement that we needed for our sins and the ability for you to dwell in our lives through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.